99. But this is still a current and a very popular problem today. Pope John the Pauls, Pope John the Paul, Pope John Paul II, and many of us are think looking around tonight, most of us will be old enough to remember him, rejects the reality of a literal hell. Now, let, let me preface this tonight. It's a day of difficult sermons. I get no joy on preaching on hell. No, none at all. It's a biblical truth. It, it doesn't, I don't feel, you know, moved. Oh, goody, I can preach on hell. But it is such an important biblical truth because of that's what should move us. To labor for the Lord, for the gospel, to endure affliction and difficulty because of the great eternal price revealed. But let me read this to you and maybe you'll see a sense of why I got stirred as I, I read this the other day. Oh. Address to the general audience of eight and a half thousand people at the Vatican on July the 28th, 1999. They said, Why are you going back to 1999? This is a bigger problem today than it was in 1999. You know, how many people, how many Christians, how many uh, uh, so called preachers and teachers today are rejecting the literal truth of the doctrine of hell? Pope John Paul II rejected the reality of a physical, literal hell, of a place of eternal fire and torment. Rather, the Pope said, hell is separation, even in this life, from the joyful communion with God. According to an official Vatican transcript of the Pope's speech, Pope John Paul II noted that the scriptural references to hell and the images portrayed by scripture are only symbolic and figurative of the complete frustration and emptiness of life without God. He added, rather than a physical place, hell is the state of those who freely and definitively separate themselves from God, as if they were somehow already joined to God. The source of all life and joy. He said, hell is a condition resulting from attitudes and actions which people adopt in this life. Concerning the concept of eternal damnation, the Pope said, damnation consists precisely in definitive separation from God, freely chosen by the human person, and confirmed with death that seals his choice forever. The Pope also added, the thought of hell and even less the improper use of biblical images, must not create anxiety or despair. Rather, he stated, it's a reminder of the freedom found in Christ. The Religion News Service reported that a Vatican-approved editorial published several weeks ago in the Jesuit journal, Seville to Catholica, agrees with the Pope's latest pronouncement. I think that would probably be news to the Jesuits. The editorial explicitly pronounced, hell exists not as a place, but as a state, a way of being the person who suffers the pain of the deprivation of God. The Pope said eternal damnation is not God's work, but is actually our own doing. Only a week earlier, the Pope stated that heaven is neither an abstraction nor a place in the clouds, but a living personal relationship of union with the Holy Trinity. Such a statement on hell is strikingly similar to that made by Billy Graham several years ago, in which he was quoted. Now, uh, I'm not getting up here to bash Billy Graham. I think early in his ministry, he did some really great stuff, but later in his ministry, he aligned with the Pope and the Vatican. And let's see what Billy Graham said. The only thing I could say for sure, this is Billy Graham now, we moved on from the Pope. The only thing I could say for sure is that hell means separation from God. We're separated from his light, from his fellowship. That is going to be hell. When it comes to a literal fire, I don't preach it because I'm not sure about it. When the scripture uses fire concerning hell, that is possibly an illustration of how terrible it's going to be, not fire, but something worse. 
a thirst for God that cannot be quenched. Both Graham and now the Pope completely reject the clear teaching of Scripture regarding the reality of a literal lake of fire that burns throughout all eternity. They're saying that it's an allegory. Now, an allegory is a story that can be interpreted to reveal me up because there is a huge issue today with those who claim to be Christian who take an allegorical approach to the scriptures, i.e. they tell God what he means in the Bible rather than letting God tell us what he means in the Bible. And may I say this, of course, there are uh, uh, difficulties sometimes with taking a literal interpretation of the scriptures, some things that are hard to be understood, but we have no right or authority whatsoever to come to the Bible and for us to determine what we think God means when he's speaking plainly because it doesn't suit what we like. So this really stirred me up because the truth of it is a literal hell truly exists and let God be true and every man alive. Let's bow our heads and pray, and then I'd like to go to the finest commentary I know on the Bible, the Bible itself. I'd like to go to the finest commentator in the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, and maybe we could seek his opinion on whether he thinks hell is just a little bit of a story, and uh, it just means that we're not experiencing our best life now. Let's pray. Father, how sad it is that those sometimes truly saved, decide that they will tell you what they think that you actually were trying to say. Father, I'm so thankful that you have spoken to us and you have told us exactly what you're saying and you have told us what you mean by what you say. Our Heavenly Father, help us not only to come to Christ for our salvation, but again, your word tells us that we're sanctified by your truth. Lord, quite frankly and quite honestly, probably most of us tonight couldn't care less about Christianity if we didn't feel there were an eternal punishment and a righteous judgment for our sins. Why on earth would we want to be Christians? God, it's more than being a nice person. And God, this world is full of plenty of nice people, and a lot of them are a lot nicer than some Christians. Hell is filled with nice people. And heaven is saved. Heaven is filled with saved sinners. Heavenly Father, can we have a literal heaven without a literal hell? Can we have a literal salvation without a literal damnation? Lord, are you so unbalanced, truly? Is your word so difficult to understand that we have to corrupt the teaching of the plain truths to make it more appealing to us and more appealing so that we feel it's easier to speak to other people as we present a fairy story allegory and hope that people will think we're nice and they want to be nice also. God, I pray you'd help us to be a Bible-believing people because on this matter, you have not left us in any debt. Help us tonight, oh God, in these few minutes just to, to restore us to our understanding where you've placed the authority, and it's that is simple. We must apply your word literally except in the places where you show us very clearly that you're not being literal and you're using an allegory to teach us a point. Is that so on this matter of hell? Make us clear tonight from your word we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 16, please, if you would. Let's come to the, to the Bible itself, the word of God, the perfect word of God, the King James Bible. As we come to the perfect Savior who came into this world to save sinners. From what? from not experiencing 
a nice communion with God in this world. He left his home in heaven, came to earth, laid down and gave up his life and was pierced on the cross of Calvary, shed his precious blood. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might just experience some light and communion as we walk through this world before we go to be with the worms. What nonsense. Do you know who preached more on a literal fiery hell in the Bible than anybody? Jesus. Jesus. And here we are, Luke chapter 16, a passage, of course, I know you know very, very well. The title tonight is Yes, Literally. You know, people use that word a lot to say, yeah, yeah, literally this happening. Yeah, literally, yeah, literally, literally. And they don't even know what what literally means most of the time, and they usually apply literally to something that wasn't very literal. But let's come to Luke chapter 16. Now, we we break in partway through a conversation uh, and some parables that went before it. But I want to draw your attention as we get into Luke chapter 19, there's a change in the emphasis. Sorry, Luke chapter 16, verse number 19. Let's read through to the end of the chapter. The Lord Jesus Christ said, and the word of God says, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. The dogs were more compassionate than the rich men. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes. Now, not the body was buried. Your body is buried and your soul, your eternal, never dying soul, goes immediately to the presence of the Lord and is then immediately received into the joys of the heavenly realm or to the fiery punishments of hell. It is an immediate judgment on remand, if you will, until the time of final sentence. You're in the holding prison of hell until the final sentence of judgment. (coughs) And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. His bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, Have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, Between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. We'll end our reading there. Now, a lot of people say this is the parable of Lazarus and the rich men. Can I ask you, what on earth gives us the authority 
to say this is a parable. You see, firstly, it is not introduced to us as a parable. Just, just turn back to Luke chapter 15 and verse number 3 where this conversation is, is starting, if you will. And Jesus introduces the conversation. He says, as he often did, and he spake this parable unto them, saying. <coughs> and he goes on <coughs> to introduce the parable. But look in chapter 16, verse number 9, at the ending of the parables, and he's gone through a couple of parables and the parable of the unjust steward. But then when Jesus has introduced a parable and taught a parable, he also had the habit of saying in some form or other, and I say unto you, make yourselves. Jesus concludes a parable by saying, and this is the application. I introduced a story that you can understand, and when we get to the end of the story, this is the spiritual application. Did he do that in this account of the rich man and Lazarus? No, he did not. Would you know there's no introduction as a parable and there's no spiritual application at the end? Secondly, there is no typology in this passage. He's not promoting spiritual types and we're putting a pearl for this and uh, we're putting a coin to represent this. We're putting a fig tree to represent that. There is no, and I say unto you at the end, it is presented as a statement of fact. Not only is it presented as a statement of fact, it contains the names of actual specific individuals, including Abraham and Moses, who have already gone on to be with the Lord. There is no indication whatsoever that this is an allegorical tale to then be interpreted and applied spiritually. This is a specific, certain account that the Lord Jesus Christ unveiled of an actual man in an actual hell and an actual beggar in Abraham's bosom. Now, I don't want to complicate this tonight, but you understand, before Christ went to the cross, the Old Testament saints under the law went to Abraham's bosom, which was in the heart of the earth. When Jesus Christ was resurrected, the Old Testament saints burst forth out of the tombs, a picture of the resurrection. Abraham's bosom became the paradise of God in heaven and went up to heaven at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. If, if that's all kind of new to you, I don't want to teach all that doctrinal stuff tonight, but but we see the saint, the saved one, had gone to the place of comfort and rest in Abraham's bosom. The rich man had gone to the place of fire and torment, and the names are all very specific, and we have absolutely no authority whatsoever to change this from a literal truth to a figurative or an allegorical truth. I would say, as far as God has gone a long way to say this is a glimpse into the spiritual world. This is actually an unveiling of what we could not see, but Jesus knew to be true. There is no authority whatsoever to say, we think Jesus was telling the parable. Then. And he's brought in Moses into the parable, and Abraham into the parable, and named Lazarus in the parable. No way. But also, may I say, let's turn to Ezekiel. I know we're there. Go back to Ezekiel 20, because there was prophecy given prophecy given about how speech of hell would become so uncomfortable that people would start to paraphrase and allegorize the truth of hell. Now, hell is reflected through the Old Testament and through the New if you have the true word of God. Anyway. Ezekiel 20, look with me at verse number 47. <clears throat> And we'll read a couple of verses. Remember, Ezekiel is a prophet. Look at what he's prophesying here in relation to hell. And say to the forest of the south, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will kindle a fire in thee, and it shall devour every green tree in thee and every dry tree. The flaming flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein. And all flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have it. It shall not be quenched. 
Then said I, our Lord God, they say, doth he not speak parables? You see, when Ezekiel opens up a prophecy looking forward and talks about an unquenchable fire of God, he said that will people not say, he's just talking in parables. And we get to the Lord Jesus Christ unveiling a certain man and Lazarus is named and Abraham is named and we get this picture of the eternal soul in the flames of hell and, 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 and a massive amount of professing Christians say, oh, this is just a parable. And Ezekiel said, that's what they'll say when it comes to the fire and not be quenched. They'll say it's just a parable. Do we have any authority? Does the have any authority yesterday, today, or forwards? Does Billy Graham and all these contemporary Christians, because they're uncomfortable to talk about the eternal punishment of God that the Bible correctly unveils, I'm not comfortable with it. I don't like it. I don't want to preach on it. I wouldn't have chosen it. But I tell you this, if there wasn't one of the stop being the Christian ages ago. Because why should I be a Christian? You say, well, there's a heaven. I don't care. Oh, but you can go to heaven and be in eternal bliss with God. I don't care. Hell, no, 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 you just die and you have no consciousness of anything. I of eternal bliss, I couldn't care less. I'll do whatever I want now and then put me in the ground and let the worms eat me if that's the end. I'm not bothered about eternal promises for the future. I am bothered about eternal promises to the future, and they are wonderful to me now because I see what God himself has done and what he saved me from. If all he saved me from is, I won't get my best life now, well, then you can shove salvation and you can shove heaven and I'll do whatever I like now and then just put me in the ground with a spade when I'm dead. If I don't know anything more beyond that and I haven't got an eternal never-dying soul, you can keep heaven, I don't care. And I'll do whatever I like right now. My undying gratitude and desire to serve the Lord is I knew I was a sinner. I knew I got saved, but I had no picture of what God had truly done for me until I read through the word of God and realized the depths of what God had saved me from. A conscious, tormented, justly deserved punishment from a holy God that would come upon an unrighteous, wicked, Christ-rejecting sinner, and I would be duly sentenced because God would have spent all of my life reaching out to me, calling me to himself, asking, pleading, if you will, to receive his son, to receive his love that he placed on Calvary's cross, and I would have spent all of my life shaking my fist at God, saying, I don't care, I don't care. You can shove that sacrifice. It's all a myth. It's all a fairy tale. I don't care. And I rightly would have deserved an eternity in hell for my sins. But if you want to be some kind of a Christian and say, well, you know, there's not really a hell. It just means you're not getting all the light and fuzzy wuzzy that you can have in this world and you can have a little close communion with God and, and then you can go and float around on the clouds. You can shove that. Hell is literal. Hell is real and God himself said so. May I say this from tonight, which I know you're familiar with, I just want to make a couple of quick points because I do not want anybody to be confused over this stuff because this is what should move us to endure the ridicule, the, the shouting, the slander, the door slamming, the subway wrappers thrown off your head when you're preaching on the street corner and all the effing and jeffing as they walk past you and tell you to shut up then we should ignore all of that because that foolish soul is not rejecting you. They're rejecting the God who is speaking to them and they are keeping their ticket to hell live. Oh, yeah. They're not just missing out on their best life now. They're missing out <laughs> on an eternal bliss and they
feel pain and punishment and sentence richly deserved in the very literal fires of a flaming hell that God himself has instituted. They won't be separated from God. God is over hell. God made hell. God made the everlasting lake of fire prepared beforehand for the devil and his angels. Not for us. He doesn't want any of us to go there. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But nonetheless, that is where we shall go because we are dead in our trespasses and our sins until we are made alive in Christ and we become a new creature in him. Can I tell you this? It is not allegorical, and I have little time for people who take this allegorical approach to the scriptures. Nearly every wrong doctrine that's out there today is because somebody says God didn't mean what he said. I know that's what it says, but really this is what God means. You can take that and you can bank that and you can do whatever you like with that and you can just get out of my face with that because when God says what he means and he means what he says, he says what he means and he means what he says, and that makes no difference whether I appreciate it or don't appreciate it, like it or don't like it. Hell, we find, is a place of sensation. There's nothing figurative about this. The senses are working in this bodily shaped soul. The wonderful music CD that many of you have probably listened to, the project that was put together the other year, on the back end of that, after all the lovely singing, is, is yours truly doing a 15 minute gospel message. We hope that the beautiful singing will unpack hearts and make them receptive to the gospel message. And in that gospel message, when I mention the punishment for sins and I talk about a bodily shaped soul going to hell for all eternity. I have people say to me, where would you get that from about the soul being bodily shaped? I get it from the Bible. People say to me, we, we don't know what the soul looks like. Well, I do. You say, where'd you get that from? Right here in the text. Verse 22, and it came to pass, the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, but the rich man died also and was buried. And in hell he lift up his what? Eyes. Being in torments. And see that Abraham was far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his what? Finger. In water. And, and cool my tongue. Lazarus had a finger and the, and the rich man had got eyes and a tongue. He said, where do you get this, this, this foolish notion that the soul is bodily shaped? From the Bible. Eyes, tongue, fingers. Our soul, which is never dying, which is circumcised from our flesh by the operation of God, Colossians 2, 10 and 11, is circumcised from our flesh by the Holy Spirit of God the minute we get saved. So within us, now we have an eternal, never-dying soul that has been separated by the Holy Spirit of God from this flesh, which is why no matter what sin we touch with this flesh, our soul is eternally saved, and that will depart. depart from the body at the time of death. You can go back to Abraham and Sarah of Genesis and find that out. saved or spend uh, at least 1,007 years still from tonight because if the Lord came back tonight, the seven years of tribulation and the thousand years of millennial kingdom until the final judgment. So these bodily shaped souls in hell tonight have still got another 1,007 years to do at least until the day of their judgment. And all the souls in heaven in eternal bliss have got another 1,007 years until the Lord returns and they'll be uh, all reunited and everything will be wonderful. And quite frankly, why wouldn't the soul be the same shape as the body, right? We're going to get the soul in a glorified body. We're body, soul, and spirit now, and we'll be body, soul, and spirit into eternity. We'll just have a glorified body, soul, and spirit. You know, you listen to philosophers, you listen to Christians, well, I think the soul might be in the pineal gland, and it might be a little peanut-shaped thing. And I hear Christians debated forever, what do you think about the soul? And you look in the Bible, it says it's got eyes, it's got a tongue, it's got a finger. I think you can pretty much figure out it's the same shape as your body. And doesn't that make a lot of sense? It just comes apart. Your body goes down, buried with a spade, and your soul goes up to be with the Lord for the sake. You know, too much smartness can make this Bible very, very difficult when people just stop believing what they're actually reading. Ooh, eyes, tongue. And he spoke, which means he had a mouth. 
But what I'm saying is the senses are working in this place of hell. Because as we have an eternal, never-dying soul fitted for <coughs> eternal bliss, then the Christ-rejecting sinner has an eternal, never-dying soul fitted for the flames of hell because fire will kill you, but our God is a consuming fire. But the eternal sinner who's rejected Christ in hell will continually have that flesh in the soul renewed so that it's a constant experience of judgment for all eternity. So do, you, do, do you like talking about that? No, I really hate it. I really hate it. But what kind of Christians would we be if we didn't tell lost people the truth? What would we say to them? You need Christ. Why? Make your life better. My life's good. Yeah, but you're a sinner. Says who? Christ. He died for your sins. Why? Well, so you can have a better life. My life's good. Well, you could go to heaven. I don't want to go to heaven. Where are you going to go from there? But when we show there's an eternal punishment, it doesn't, doesn't mean they're going to agree with it. But they can make a lot of sense out of it because a criminal is punished in this world under the law and receives the punishment, right? A lawbreaker receives the punishment in this world and is judged by the judge and sentenced. I wonder where that comes from. So doesn't it make sense that the eternal judge can give an eternal punishment and he can give an eternal life sentence? To who? Because a Christ-rejected sinner like you and I once were are the ones we murdered his son. And the sentence for murder is life. It's a place of sensation. The senses are working in this bodily shaped soul in a literal hell, and he's not having a fine time of it. You know, you, you come across those fools, and maybe we were like that before. Oh, I don't care if I'm going to hell. I'm going to party down there with all my mates who were going down there as well. A rich man never found his mates down there. He didn't, he didn't drop into some kind of shindig party going on. He was in, what does it say, torments. Feeling the, the, the heat of the flames and the weeping and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. Would you go with me to Matthew 5 a minute? Everybody loves a sermon on the mat, don't they? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. The lovely sermon on the mat. You know what I find about the people who like to overemphasize the, the beatitudes, the blessings in the sermon on the mat? I don't talk much about verse 22. Matthew 5, 22, again, this is Jesus preaching, God the Son, the Son of God. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Rakish shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of what? Not living your best life now? Shall be in danger of, what does it say? Hell fire. fire. Who coined the phrase? Hellfire, Jesus. Who preached on hellfire? Jesus. Oh, they're one of them hellfire preachers. Praise God. Then you're preaching like Jesus. That's where it comes from. Jesus. I don't mean the invented Jesus because of cultural Christianity. I don't mean the invented Jesus of the Sodomite Church of England. I mean the real Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, in the real book of of God, the Holy Bible, and he said they shall be in danger of hell fire, and that hell fire will place you for all eternity in torments, and in torments you can beg and plead to get out of there all you like. It is a great gulf fixed. You're never getting out of it. Nobody from heaven is going to hell, and nobody from hell is going to heaven, and praying for the saints and praying money to these rip-off priests for prayers for the dead is religious nonsense. It's charlatanism. If you can't pray for them before they go, if you can't take the gospel for them uh, to them before they go, then don't assuage your guilt by paying for them after they're dead. They're already in hell. 
Who says it? Jesus. God. Not me. Not all them hellfire, Bible thumping, tub thumping preachers. Where's the love of Jesus? Well, the love of Jesus in the lovely Jesus himself said you're in danger of hell fire. In hell, there were sensations. Can I say this? Hell is clearly not just a grave. You know, a lot of people like to try and explain it like this and, uh, and to use theological terms. Well, let's ignore purgatory because that's just invented by the Roman Catholics, but that does have a theological term. It's called conditionalism. So, you know, You've lived in a bit of sin, but you've believed in Jesus, uh, but you, you, you've lived in sin, so you've got to go down to the fires of purgatory for a bit, and depending on how many sins you've committed, then you'll be like blowtorched in purgatory until those sins get burnt off for your eternal never dying soul, and when they're burnt off, off to heaven you go. It's called conditionalism. You got conditioned in hell and fitted for heaven. Where's that in the Bible? I'll tell you where. So if you're looking, nowhere. <laughs> the other one is annihilationism. Because it's hard. It's hard for us in the flesh to talk about hell. It's a horrible thought. It's a horrible subject. It really is, isn't it? But it's the obvious balance to heaven. Yeah. Annihilationism is the other full stop. And they say, like the Pope did, you get saved, you become a Christian, you experience this wonderful communion with God in this life, you live your best life now, and then you go off, fluttering off to the to float on the clouds with Jesus forever. And if you don't accept that, what happens? You're annihilated. You just die. No hell, no, no conscious, just you don't sorry, you don't know anything. You're just finished. One food. If the Bible taught annihilation, I would take that. I think most people out there would take I tell you what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't go knocking on anybody's door. I wouldn't go preaching on any street corner and say, get saved or or know nothing. I wouldn't bother getting out of bed on a cold day to God. I wouldn't feel like I got a message worth preaching. You know, you can have an eternal promise or... Do what you like now with no consequences. I'm not going to go and stand on a creek corner and treat preach people if that's all the best I've got to offer. Because I can understand that there are people say, well, that's that's an easy choice. I'll just take this life now and feed me to the worms. And I'll stop preaching and say, yeah, I probably agree with you. I'll do the same. Hell is clearly not just the grave. I've just got to Isaiah 5. Isaiah 5. Now, I know I'm preaching to the saved tonight, so I'm not trying to scare you into salvation by talking about hell. I'm just trying to get you to understand, let's not forget, hell is a literal place of literal sensation, and it is a literal location. It's down. Isaiah 5, pick it up with me at verse number 11, because this gives a little bit of context. And I didn't use this verse this morning. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial, the tablet and the pipe and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge and their honourable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory, and the multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Hell is a place that can enlarge and consume as many as choose to go there, and they go there at the holy and righteous judgment of God because of unholy and unrighteousness and wickedness. 
It is a righteous judgment on wickedness. There is no limit to the numbers that it can take, but it need take none except Satan, the beast, and the false prophet, because that's all it was created for, that unholy trinity. Not one single soul in this world needs to go to hell. Not one. But we need to remember that they do, and it is there, and it is real, and it is literal. And when we go from this place, everyone we love, everyone we know, everyone we care about that ridicules us, rejects it, laughs in your face, the motivation to continue is we don't want them to go into a place that's been enlarged for them. That is literally true. It is not a story. It is not for interpretation, it is literally true. It is a location into which you descend. I mean, I don't know much about the geology of the earth, but I do know this. It's got a place of flame and fire down there. But it's more, well, I'll say I know it. I don't know it. Scientists tell me I have no reason to disbelieve it because the word of God says that that's the place that it is. And he says it's down. Heaven's up. Heaven's north. Hell is south. It's down. So we find from this man in Luke chapter 16, we find from this literal account in Luke chapter 16, which is introduced as a literal account, is not introduced as a parable, is not concluded as a parable, and it refers to Abraham, Moses, and Lazarus, and the rich man. It is very certain, it's very specific, that in hell it is a place of sensation, not a place of annihilation or conditionalism, and hell is a actual location, Old Testament and new. It, it's not a fancy doctrine made up by people who just want to scare others into being saved. Jesus Christ himself came from heaven to this earth and preached about hellfire and preached about the anguish of hell and preached about God in Jude chapter 7. We find it all the way through the Bible and there's plenty in the book of Revelation as well. It's Jude chapter 1, it's one chapter, verse number 7, I should say. Jude 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal fire. Not suffering the vengeance of not living their best life now. What were they going to Revelation? Go to Revelation chapter 20. At least 1,007 years from tonight, if the Lord called us to himself tonight, in 1,007 years from today, we would enter Revelation chapter 20. It can't be any sooner than that. Because we've got Jacob's trouble for seven years and 1,000-year millennial kingdom, but after the end of all that, which is a minimum of 1,007 years from tonight, if the Lord called us to be with himself tonight, in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 10, we see, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. You see, the unholy trinity. Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. God's the originator, the true trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Satan is the imitator with the unholy trinity. A place of heaven and bliss, a place of fire and judgment. Where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Forever and ever. Eternity. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. I haven't got time to unpack that tonight. This is the end of all things in terms of time. This is the end of everything that's yet to come. All the prophecy that's yet to come. All the literal reign of Jesus Christ on her, here on earth. All of that. After this is all done, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it. From whose faith the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man 
according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Do you see, hell is remand. It's God's remand prison. But you've already been judged in advance as guilty. Nobody's coming out of it. It's a place of punishment already now. And then in no less than 1,007 years from tonight, hell and death will be delivered up to the everlasting lake of fire. That's their hell for all eternity, an everlasting lake of fire. And all who reject Christ will be in the company of the devil and the beast and the false prophet and the lake of fire. And everyone who's rejected Christ for all eternity will be in the place of the everlasting lake of fire. The book of Revelation is a book of mystery and it's a book of misery, but thank God, finally, it's a book of majesty, the majesty of God. Well, we're in Revelation 21, verse 8. Here's a verse we're always using with people on the streets and the doors, isn't it? Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Anybody see anything in there that makes you think that's just God's way of trying to tell us we're not living out our best life now if we don't know Jesus? We're just missing out on something in this world. We're missing out of the presence of God in this world. And all those references to hell have gotten nothing to do with what happens to you after you die and you and you never die in soul they're just god's way of trying to influence you to have a better life with jesus now but he doesn't really mean what those verses say there's too many of them to ignore them. there's too many of them to just wish them away there is no conditionalism there is no purgatory there is no annihilationism. There is no allegory to be found. There is a time when hope will run out. You say that sounds hopeless. That's right. We're talking about the time when hope is finished. When God is finished. When everything is finished, there is no hope. But there is hope now. There's hope for every wicked, Christ-rejecting sinner. You say, who's that? The people who are just like you and I were before. So. There's hope for them the same as there was for us. There's joy for them the same as there was for us. There's heaven to be gained and hell to be shunned the same as there was for us. And to do so, God is using us to go and tell them the full gospel message, not some positive, allegorical Positive mental attitude, Jesus story. The gospel is how the cross saved us from our sins and the ultimate penalty and punishment for those sins in hell. And we live as saved sinners under the grace of God until we're perfected in his glory. May we not lose sight of God's eternal plan that should keep us motivated to be right with the Lord and to get out there and to keep doing all that we can to get the gospel to people who do not want to hear it any more than you did. But we need to see beyond that to their end, not just relaxing our end. We need to see their end. May God use that truth and may God do this with every fool who tells God what he means. May we just believe what God says and we'll figure the rest out later. Father, our God, what a horror it must be to be led by a godless pope. What a horror it is that so much of professing Christianity today they even open your book.
idea why people advice would even spend five minutes in a place that tells you what you think and tells you what you mean. Lord, if we can tell you, I don't think you're any kind of God. But I know that we can't tell you, you tell us. You're a sovereign, almighty God. You are truth. You are high and holy and lifted up, and you are a loving, gracious God. You're a God who gives us hope in Christ. The Lord, may we never forget there is a day for those who reject Christ where all hope will be gone. There will be not so much as a drop of water to cool and calm a screaming tongue. Lord, we don't like to think of hell. We don't like to read of it, and we certainly don't like to preach and teach on it. And I pray that we get the balance right with that. But help us, Lord, within ourselves just to get that settled so that we're willing to endure some difficult times and ridicule because we don't want anybody. Beforehand for the devil and his fallen angels. Father, I pray that we'll not see any person in our mind's eye as being worthy of going to hell when you died for them and shed your precious blood. Father, gave your son for every one of them as you did for us. Lord, may the, may the truth about a literal hell humble us. May we remember indeed what we have been saved from, sin's ultimate penalty. Oh, God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness to us. May we speak of it with others. And they may share the great joy and hope that we have through Christ alone. In his name we praise you. Amen. Amen. Amen.